thank you, Lauren, so much for this introduction. And, and thank you to you and to Matthew for the invitation. And, and, and thanks to everyone else for coming today. Um, I'm really happy to be talking to you. Um, as Lauren said, I'm a historian and more specifically an intellectual historian. So uh, what I mostly have been working on is trying to trace how these uh, philosophical, political and psychoanalytic ideas uh, have contributed to the elaboration of institutional psychotherapy. But I never uh, quite know what this means in clinical terms or how they how these ideas have been translated or could be applied in a clinical setting. So, so I've really enjoyed talking to, to clinicians, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, psychoanalysts throughout this project. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear what you think about this, um, especially because it, you know this is something that Lauren and, um, and Matthew and I have been talking about for a long time. It seems like some of these ideas uh, seem very, can appear somewhat dated in the medical world of today. So I'll be curious to hear what, you know, if you incorporate any of these techniques in your own practices or, or thinking. So um, the book that I published last spring um, is a history of the psychiatric movement that came to be known as institutional psychotherapy. So for the next 40 minutes or so, I wanna guide you through four questions. Um, and also if you could mute yourselves, that would be great if those of you who aren't, let me see if I can get Okay, um, so first question is where and where and when did um, institutional psychotherapy emerge? Two, who are the main actors in the elaboration of institutional psychotherapy? Three, what was its central theoretical intervention? Um, so basically, what did these doctors argue? And four, what was or is the legacy? What can be the legacy of institutional psychotherapy today? So the first to the first to kind of trace the first question, the emergence of institutional psychotherapy, I want to take you back to uh, the Second World War, and in particular to the uh, to, to to June of 1940, basically. Uh, uh, so the background here is important because I think the context will help us understand how institutional psychotherapy emerged in this particular context of the war. Uh, so in May of 1940, the Germ Germany attacks France. By June of 1940, German soldiers are marching in Paris. Uh, the government moves to Vichy. And, uh, and uh, so basically France gets split into two and there's a free zone and an occupied zone. The, occup the free zone is under the leadership of this character, um, uh, Marshal Philippe Pétain. So all this is pretty well known. What is less well known, however, is what happened in French psychiatric hospitals during those years. Now, the Third Reich, as some of you are aware, I'm sure, had an explicit policy concerning mental illness. It openly embraced eugenics and the forced euthanasia of those that it deemed the incurably sick. So this is what came to be known as Action um, T4, and it was central to Hitler's program of racial purification and social regeneration. Um, the, 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 this action T4 resulted in 70,000 official deaths, but historians estimate that it was actually closer to um, 200,000 deaths. Now the, the German case has been pretty well documented, but what is less talked about is what was happening in France during this time. Unlike the Third Reich, the Vichy regime never had an explicit policy of extermination of the cognitively disabled, but what it did was allow patients to essentially die of cold, of hunger, or a lack of care. And some historians have referred to this as, um, as uh, a soft extermination. So this is, for example, two books that came out um, in the so 80s and 90s about, about, about this process in French psychiatric hospitals. Um, and this resulted in around 40,000 deaths in the hospitals themselves. So this is the context in which one psychiatric hospital, the hospital that, I, that I'm interested in this book called Saint Alban, uh, tried to resist the war and to feed its patients by hoarding food with the help of the local population. Along these efforts to basically survive the war, the doctors, the staff that worked at the hospital began to radically rethink the practical and the theoretical bases of psychiatric care. So this is where Saint Alban with this hospital was, so you see on the red dot here, you see it's a kind of hilly um, wooded area. Uh, it's the middle of, of sort of nowhere. You see it's far, far from any big city. And, um, and, and I think in some ways the geographic location was also important to allow them to do what they were doing without getting too noticed by the, by the Vichy authorities. 
So I'm spending some time setting up the context because this, the context of the war was absolutely key in bringing together the cast of characters who eventually laid the groundwork for institutional psychotherapy. These were doctors, nurses, and staff, but also poets, visual artists, philosophers, and political activists who, despite their various backgrounds, shared a vision of psychiatry as a deeply political practice. As they saw it, the war in fascism had made clear the extent to which the political and the psychic were intimately connected, not just through the genocidal project that I was just describing, but more generally. One of the kind of hypotheses of institutional psychotherapy was that you could not understand, so this is, sorry, this is the hospital again, um, before the war, you see it here and, and the fields around it. Um, so one of the hypotheses of institutional psychotherapy was that you could not understand the rise of fascism, phenomenal collaboration, but also um, authoritarianism without psychoanalytic concepts such as the unconscious, alienation, fantasy, desire, identification, or transference. And I'll return to these notions later, but this is sort of something that really marked all of them. But for now, let me tell you about some of the people who ended up at Saint Alban because I think their background can also help um, um, help us understand some of their theories. Uh, so this, the, this is the second part, uh, who were the main actors? The, the most important name in the genesis of institutional psychotherapy was perhaps this character, uh, François Tosquelles, a Catalan psychiatrist who was born in Reus, south of, south of Barcelona in 1912. You see him here wearing his um, classically Catalan <laughs> tie. Um, as a student, Tosquelles participated in the vibrant Catalan political and cultural effervescence of the interwar period. These were crucial years for the labor movement, a labor movement in which anarchism and syndicalism played a key role. Many of the groups that emerged during this period were opposed to the official Spanish Communist Party, which was, was known as the PCE, because they believed that the, that the Communist Party was much too subservient to Moscow and too uncritical of Stalinism. Instead, these groups preached federalism, decentralization, worker solidarity, self-management, and consciousness raising through culture. In 1935, several activists from these anarchist groups, including Tosquelles, who was 24 at the time, founded the PUM. The PUM's po politics were in line with the main anarchist organizations of the time, but the new party was especially adamant about denou denouncing Stalinism and the anti-democratic, authoritarian, and bureaucratic turn that the Soviet Union had taken in the 1930s. Um, the, the PUM played a foundational role in Tosquesa's political awakening. Um, it really kind of marked psychoanalysis and activism in the PUM were the two sort of most important things in Tosquesa's youth. Um, and you might've heard about the PUM from George Orwell's novel, uh, Homage to Catalonia and also Ken Loach's film, Land and Freedom. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but it, it's still, the Pum still has this kind of mythical aura about it as a kind of leftist movement that was really, um, you know, that really kind of emphasized uh, constant critique. In several interviews, Tosquelles explained that the Pum had taught him to be wary of the all power, what he called in French, le tout pouvoir. So this is a quote from Tosquelles. Stalin wanted the Pum to join Madrid and spread Spanish propaganda with the monarchy, the military in power, and to say, all power to the Soviets. To accept centralization was to accept to speak Castellano where, when our, the Castilians are our oppressors. And you see, for example, some of the posters of, of, of the Pum at the time, um, you know, all in Catalan, uh, again, trying to differentiate, linking, for example, Catalanism to a certain kind of political activism. Now, in parallel to his political activism, Tosquelles began medical school, and he chose to specialize in psychiatry. Psychiatry was a sort of booming field in the Barcelona of the interwar years. Uh, at this time, Barcelona was often called the li a little Vienna because of all the psychoanalysts from Eastern Europe who had ended up there um, in the, inter in the interwar um, years. Um, so this is the Peramate Institute. Uh, in Reus, where Tuskay is practiced. Um, and you see, it's actually, this, it's a gorgeous building, right? It's the hospital where he sort of began his career. And, and in fact, the, um, the kind of the architecture, this beautiful modernist architecture played a role also in um, this movement of psychiatric reform. So I'll, the, we, I'll talk about the architecture of the hospital later, but it's something you can already start to see in this early days. Um, this was Tuskay's teacher in Barcelona, 
uh, the doctor Emily Mirai Lopez, um, who held the first chair of psychiatry in Barcelona. Um, and as you can see here, he was the author of a, a kind of classic psych psychiatric manual, but he was also uh, an avid reader of psychoanalysis. So Freud, of course, but also of Jacques Lacan, um, who at the time was very young um, and who provided many of the foundational concepts for what later came to be known as institutional psychotherapy. In particular, L Mirai Lopez and Tosquets at this time were very interested in Lacan very early work, his um, 1932 thesis on paranoid psychosis and its relationship to the personality, um, which was published in 1932. Um, this, the thesis in my book, and I, I read the thesis as a kind of manifesto for a new approach to psychiatry, a psychiatry that was very close to psychoanalysis. The thesis revolved around a case study of Ime, a 38-year-old railway, railway clerk who had inexplicably inexplicably tried to kill a famous actress in Paris. Lacan's question was the following. Did madness originate in the brain, as most neurologists believed at the time, in the body as an acquired or organic disease, or in the social and familial worlds of the patients? His answer was clear, and I'm quoting him here in the conclusion to his book. He says, it is absurd to attribute these phenomena to a specifically neurological automatism. And the word automatism here is important, right? Because uh, the, what Lacan was really trying to fight was the idea that you could find a single origin to psychosis. Um, and instead, he, he argued, psychosis needed to be studied in relation to the formation of what he called a, a personality. So a much more complex a set of, of, um, of, of causes, if you'd like. Lacan's ideas were revolutionary in at least two ways. Um, in the field of psychiatry, they were very revolutionary because it was a critique of mainstream psychiatry. Lauren, can you mute whoever is um, not muted, if you don't mind? Thanks. Um, so in the field of psychiatry, it was a critique of mainstream psychiatry, which largely still focused on brain localization. So trying to find a cause of particular behaviors on people's brains, right? As Lacan saw it, psychiatric clinical work needed to open itself to sociological inquiry, to medical examination, and most importantly, to psychoanalytic treatment. So according to Lacan in this book, psychoanalysis was the only discipline that had been able to provide a coherent theory of subjectivity, a subject that was constructed in relation to conscious and unconscious representations of others. So what this means is that for Lacan, the, the social, right, these others, were absolutely key in, the, in any psychic development. So that was kind of why it was so um, important for, for, for the field of psychiatry. But it was also a revolutionary um, in terms of psychoanalysis and the history of psychoanalysis because Freud um, had been quite clear about the fact that his talking cure was primarily designed for neurotic patients and not for psychotic patients who had a very different relationship to language. So this is Schreber's um, 1903 memoir that Freud um, wrote about. And essentially one of his conclusions was that psychoanalysis was going to have a hard time treat, working with or yeah, helping in some ways psychotic patients. And Lacan's, you know, argued, disagreed with this and, and sort of offered a way and would offered um, hints for how we could use psychoanalysis to treat psychosis. Lacan's thesis was not exactly rejected by the psychiatric community, but it was essentially ignored. Rather, its early champions were the surrealists who welcomed Lacan's innovative approach to madness and discussed it in their journals. So this is one of the things that I was really interested in the book in the archives of Saint Alban is finding um, these early, like you can see here photocopies if you'd like of, of Lacan's works. There's a, you'll notice here there's a price because they were selling some of these books to the patients, to the other doctors. And, um, and I looked through some of the medical journals, the kind of most important French medical journals of the 1940s, and the doctors of Saint-Alban were quoting Lacan, Lacan's very early work around the personality of the complex or psychic identification. And my hunch is that it's almost, it's, it's also through institutional psychotherapy that Lacan's ideas became uh, popular in medical milieus, right? Um, and, and this kind of goes against the Elizabeth, the classic Elizabeth Rudinesco um, thesis, which I'm showing here, which is that Lacan's thought was um, popularized through the Surrealists and the, the Kozhev seminar in Hegel. I mean, I think all that is true, 
but it also had another mode of diffusion through these um, photocopies that they were passing around uh, amongst each other. And, and what's cool is that you had, um, I mean, what's cool if you're into this kind of stuff and feel like Kenyan uh, details, but what's cool is that some of these seminars that weren't published, like were, that were published much later, like this one, for example, was published in 1998, it was already available in photocopy forms, you know, from 1957 and circulating around like this. So, um, so this is for Lacan. So back to Tosquelles. Um, how did he end up at Saint Alban? Well, the answer here is the Spanish Civil War. Like most Republicans, Tosquelles joined the resistance through the Pum and was sent to the front. It's at the front, as he was trying to figure out how, how essentially how to be useful during the war, that he decided to set up a therapeutic community to treat the combatants who were traumatized by the war, but also the army officers who were leading the, the combats. The idea was that psychiatry could be practiced anywhere and also that you needed to treat the whole institution, not just the people who were sick, but the community in its entirety. And this is kind of something that he's gonna, it's really important to him and will, he will take to Saint Alban with him. Um, in January of 1939, after Franco's last final victory, Tosquelles, along with many other Republicans, fled Spain, crossed the Pyrenees and ended up in one of the many concentration camps that the French government had set up to house these Spanish refugees. So Tosquelles was placed in this camp right here called Cetfon in the southwest of France. And this is a picture of the camp. You see it here um, from above. Um, and this is the camp sort of more closely. Now to say that li the living condi conditions in the camp were harsh is a euphemism. Several of the refugees died of hunger, disease, or exhaustions. Others were driven to suicide. They were amassed in overcrowded barracks surrounded by barbed wire, electrical projectors, and surveillance posts. They slept in haystacks with little wood available for heat and in deplorable hygienic and sanitary conditions. And this is something that Tuskeis talked a lot about, his experience in the camp and his sort of realization of, of how awful these, these things could be um, and how in some ways after being in a camp when you showed up in a psychiatric hospital, the kind of similarities between psychiatric hospitals and camps, right? Structure, like the kinds of the living conditions in both places were really similar. Um, here again, Tosquez was also shocked by the psychological effects of the, that the camp had on refugees, but also on the guards. As he put it, it, it was in this, so this is a quote from him, um, it was in this concentrationist environment. This concentrationist environment was directly responsible for all kinds of war neuroses, including barbed wire disease um, and all these other diseases that were coming out because of the camp. So in some ways to, to try to deal with this, um, Tuskeyes set up a, a psychiatric service, um, this time within the camp, and he recruited political activists, artists, musicians to help him organize activities. There was only um, one other psychiatric nurse, I think, and one doctor. The rest, he says, were all normal people. So, and, and he says, I think this is the one of the places where I conducted very good psychiatry in the concentration camp in the mud. So he would recruit these other people from the camp and organize a series of group therapies or group activities. Um, to try to, in some ways, uh, temper some of the effects of camp, of this, what he was calling camp psychosis or camp neurosis. News of, and this is again, his, his kind of seal, right, from the camp. Uh, and here he is here with, with, the, with, his, with his collaborators. News of Tuskeya's work in the camp and at the front traveled in medical circles and eventually came to the attention of the director of Saint Alban, uh, the hospital, who invited Tuskeyes to join him in January of 1940. So Tuskeyes arrived in Saint Alban in the middle of the war to find another form of, of concentrationism, this time with Vichy and the German occupation of France, as well as the humanitarian disaster that I mentioned at the beginning, the massive death toll in psychiatric hospitals. I mean, people were just dying everywhere. And so obviously all psychiatrists were extremely kind of aware and conscious of what was going on. So this is the context that gave birth to institutional psychotherapy and that brought together the cast of characters that I study in this book. All of them had a double conviction. One, that psychiatry could no longer claim a position of detachment, objectivity, or pure science, and that it needed to reckon with its intrinsically political nature. And two, that the political and the psychic were intimately linked. This meant at least two things. 
that when you treated a patient, you needed to also treat her or his social environment. So you needed to cure the hospital at the same time as you cured the patient. This also meant that psychiatric and psychoanalytic notions could help us understand politics, fascism and beyond. Okay, so three, what, were, what was the main kind of their main theoretical intervention? What, was, what did these doctors argue? Um, it's hard to come up with a sort of succinct definition of institutional psychotherapy, but I think this quote by Jean Ouri um, summarizes the goal of the movement or the, the goal of the, of the practice, if you'd like, quite well. Um, so this is actually Tosquet's in his later years with, with Ouri, and you know, this is Ouri right here, and Bonafé, another important doctor. He said, Uri says, institutional psychotherapy was the act of setting up all kinds of mechanisms to fight every day against that which can turn the whole collective towards a concentrationist or a segregationist structure. So what does this mean? Well, you know, what, what, is, in some, what is a concentrationist or a segregationist structure? So this is where I think the background that I gave you is important to understand what, what they mean by this. Um, according to the practitioners of institutional psychotherapy, Institutions were necessary for all social and psychic organization, right? So we all needed, we all need families, parties, unions, hospitals, schools, all of, the, all of these are institutions that are really important to one's psychic uh, balance or well-being. The problem with institutions was not that they existed or that they generated conflict, of course they did. The problem was that they had this potential to become concentrationist, authoritarian, hierarchical, stagnant, oppressive. And this had become especially clear to Tosquets after the war, while he was at the PUM, in the front, and at the camp. Stalinism for him was a great example of leftist politics becoming concentrationist. That means authoritarian, anti-democratic. The camp similarly didn't have to be this horrifying environment. I mean, at the end of the day, 